Perfect. Okay. Very good. Thanks a lot, Caroline. Um, so thanks for attending uh, the second talk of the uh, of the morning. It's a very intense morning. Uh, we have more talks in the afternoon plus many other events. Um, but um, to the, the uh, now we uh, we have Marre Want who's visiting us. Uh, it's uh, really great that she accepted to spend some time here with people in our department, in uh, the people working with uh, with uh, Marseille as well. Um, and uh, I hope that it won't be the last time that we see we see you around here. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a very good sign. So Marre Want uh, is uh, working at uh, at the SIC Institute. Uh, she at the uh, I have it in English here. So it's the uh, uh, Institute for Economic Analysis. Uh, and uh, she's also an, an ICREA uh, research professor, uh, which is uh, it's an honor to be at, at ICREA as well as uh, with, uh, with her. Um, and uh, she, she has a very long uh, trajectory uh, and very intense from uh, what, I, what I could read. She works on uh, uh, the environmental costs of pollution uh, from electricity generation. And uh, I'm sure that she'll be talking uh, a lot about this. And uh, she has been working in uh, at the MIT where she did the PhD, then at Stanford. And uh, she's uh, apart from uh, working at the, uh, um, at the, at the at this uh, Institute uh, uh, of Physic, uh, she is also a part-time professor at the uh, at Northwestern University in the, in, uh, in the US. Uh, and she has many other appointments that are uh, very, uh, very interesting and very important. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the last news is that apart from getting the, uh, uh, the uh, prize for the uh, uh, Young uh, Researcher National uh, Prize uh, for Research, uh, for uh, Young Researchers in uh, Catalonia, she got also the uh, 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 prize for the National Prize for researchers of the uh, Spanish government um, and uh, for economics and social sciences, yes. uh, social sciences. So that's that's really impressive. And uh, well, I coincided with her, uh, we worked together at a, at a hearing at the uh, Spanish parliament, which was very interesting. And uh, it was really great to see what she was talking about. And uh, I thought that uh, many of you would be interested as well to learn uh, what she's doing, which is very interesting and very socially relevant. So Mar, floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so um, all the stickers is from my daughter, OK? Uh, she designed them if you are interested. So uh, I, I'm just joking. But yeah, that's my daughter. Uh, I, I I am older than that, although I'm very glad I can still go, I get the Young Talent Awards. Uh, it's it's probably the last time. Uh, so uh, this project is kind of the most nerdy project that I have. It's called the Smart Rationing, and it's kind of about extreme events. So thinking about climate change and its largest impacts when it comes to the grid. It's thinking about how to deal with the grid, the electricity grid, when uh, under extreme conditions, we no longer can procure electricity to everyone. Um, so um, as you may know, we, we do need to decarbonize the economy to stop emitting greenhouse gases. And that means that uh, in, in, in a very large share, it means becoming electric and using electricity for many more things. And it also means making this electricity carbon free. Um, however, uh, this energy transition, as you may know, is ongoing. And here we have lots of renewables in Spain, for example, and Portugal, maybe not in Catalonia, but that's a different topic and presentation. But at least uh, in the rest of Spain and Portugal, there are lots of renewables, but there are some concerns that uh, some days it's not windy, some days it's not sunny, and then you have some limits to how much you can do with renewable energy. That's one concern. Batteries are kicking in and they are doing a lot to reduce these concerns, but it's still something that we worry about a little bit because it can be expensive. The other thing we worry about is extreme events um, nowadays. There are many more days of extreme heat and sometimes even more days of uh, extreme cold, depending on the geography. And this can put substantial pressure in the electricity grid, especially if people have adopted this, this electricity for heating and cooling, which is becoming more and more common. It's a positive thing that people are adopting electricity for heating and cooling but it will put an additional pressure on the grid and we need to make sure that the grid can keep up with all these uh, growing demands. 
And another example of a growing demand is uh, electric vehicles, although electric vehicles are a funny case because they can be a growing pressure, but they can also be a growing assistance because electric vehicles can be also a battery, a mobile battery. But uh, unfortunately, from a technological and implementation point of view, we are still not there. And so far, electric vehicles are a pressure and not a resource. Eventually, they will, but, but there will be this transition that will be a, li a little bit difficult. Uh, so in electricity, for those of you uh, that don't know, um, it's critical to produce as much electricity as we need at the same time, so instantaneously. This means that some of it will come from uh, power plants, some of it from solar panels, some of it from wind, some of it from hydro water that you throw when you need it. But at, at the end of the day, you need this to be in full sync. And again, this is something we worry about under extreme events. So this project, I had been thinking about it a long time ago when there were wildfires in California in 2018, 2019. And there was the need for shutting down power for people. And I started thinking about it again um, during the energy crisis in Europe. The winter ended up being very mild, but there were concerns that there wouldn't be enough electricity and there might be the need for blackouts for cutting electricity. Uh, more broadly in the US especially, these extreme weather event blackouts are already occurring and Texas is one of the places where this is happening the most. Both in winter and summer, Texas has been having systemic blackouts in which you know that you will not be able to produce as much electricity as you need. This is not a hurricane, which can also cause blackouts, but it's unpreventable because it will destroy equipment. This is the greatest kind of fine, but you are doing your math and there is not enough power to satisfy what people would like to consume at a given point in time. And again, in Texas, this does happen often uh, or more often than it's usual for, for a country like the US or Europe. Um, it happens maybe once or twice every, every year, uh, lately. Um, and some of them have been very large. I will mention them um, in a bit. So in Europe, luckily, these are relatively unlikely, uh, but there is concern that this would, will become more likely with these growing pressures from climate change. And I have to say, I think I have a couple of slides later, but these are kind of Monday and, and Tuesday in developing countries. So these systemic blackouts are an everyday experience in many other countries. And our work that we are doing, we are trying to propose better ways uh, to do rationing, better ways to ration power when you have uh, run out of options. So you have done everything you could and your math is still not adding up. You need to cut power. We're gonna propose a better way to cut power. So this is the, ex the example I was uh, mentioning from Texas. The most extreme event was in the winter of 2021 when they had an entire week with blackouts because it was too cold and their natural gas supply froze. This was totally unexpected, but power plants in Texas, they were not very protected from cold because it's not cold in Texas and they basically froze parts of it. So you they couldn't run all their natural gas power plants and it was very, very cold. So there was a growing pressure on the grid from electric heating and they had to start cutting people and it was an entire week. So I usually present this to economists and they ask me, oh, but why didn't they let the price go up? That would have fixed it. Well, Texas has one of the highest price limits in the, in the US and in the world. It's $10,000 per megawatt hour, which is an insane amount. Usually it's 50 to $100 per megawatt hour. And they had an entire week in which every single hour, the price of electricity was $10,000 per megawatt hour. And they still couldn't make demand and supply uh, much. Actually, the reaction from the Public Utility Commission in Texas after this critical event was not to increase the price cap, it was to reduce it because having an entire week of $10,000 prices was devastating for companies and households. So the price at some point doesn't work and this paper is about when you have run out of options, when your price is as high as seems plausible, uh, what can you do to limit power? Uh, as I was mentioning, this is a daily experience in many countries. In South Africa, they had been having blackouts for 
many years, every single day. Interestingly, for those of you who are political scientists, there was an election and two months before the election, they figured out they didn't need to have blackouts. Uh, it's interesting, but there's a lot of research to see the discriminatory aspects of these blackouts and who are the households that are hurt the most. A student at Northwestern uh, is working on this. Um, I am very interested in the South Africa experience because the mechanism that I will describe you today, they have a pilot implementing it. So I'm trying to see if I can catch them, but so far, no luck. Uh, I am also working in Hanoi with a utility there, very preliminary, but we are trying to see if we can implement some of our ideas there. Unfortunately, there are smart meters that are not as smart as the ones we have in mind. So we are trying to adapt a little bit our work for a kind of Dumber, dumber smart meters. Uh, but that's that's also a place where in the summer they are having every every summer they have blackouts uh, in the moments when people need cooling the most. So uh, obviously there are private options and individual actions that one can take to protect yourself from these blackouts. And indeed in Texas, it has become very common among the very high income to have solar panels with batteries that will be able to provide electricity when the grid is completely gone. This is a very private solution to a very public problem, but it does uh, kind of protect the very high income. In other places like California, there's been work to uh, create public shelters. These are um, a combination of many solar panels and oversized batteries so that a, a building, typically a high school, can become an island, a microgrid, when, um, when the grid falls. So my work is kind of related to this, but just trying to think, okay, when the grid falls, can we do it uh, better? Can we avoid blackouts altogether? And what I will talk about today is avoiding blackouts altogether um, with smart meters. So what I will tell you about are power limits. And because this is... We are in Barcelona today. All of you will know what they are. This is the limit at your home that it will trip your house when you connect to many things. Most of you know what I'm talking about, yes? When you put the oven, the washing machine, and then the hair dryer, and too much. So these power limits used to be um, a physical thing in your meter that would worsen your meter. It was what we call a bug. You would put a bug in the meter to make it worse. But now they can be adapted digitally and on real time. So we propose to use these power limits to reduce consumption from people. Uh, it's not great if there is an extreme event, but it's better than having no power. And that's kind of what we will explore uh, here. It's technologically feasible. And here in Spain or France, you don't even have to do any capital investments. In places like South Africa, they actually have had to put better smart meters in the places where they are running the pilots because unfortunately their other smart meters are cheaper and don't have this uh, te technical ability. So today I will talk about a very simple mechanism, uh, which is everyone will have the same limit, but it will be a common limit under extreme events. We are still exploring whether these limits should be different for different people and why. That's a whole can of worms, a whole Pandora box. But for this project, as of now, we just think about everyone has the same limit and we are not allowing for different limits. Um, now, what we will show is that it, it offers a better solution. I think it is intuitive that with this, you can lower power, but not completely remove power, which seems better. Uh, but I guess uh, they can also be controversial. And for example, in South Africa, they have these pilots and people are coming up with articles that, um, that this is too intrusive, that it's preventing people from consuming whatever they want. The truth is that the alternative is that they would have no power, okay? So uh, it's, it's maybe more controversial than it should be, but it's basically things that need to be implemented with care and they need to be communicated very well. Uh, for them to work um, socially. So the finding that we have is that smart rationing is better. I think we we that's intuitive. What maybe was our big discovery in this project is that it's not only intuitively better, 
we discovered that we could get what we call blackout equivalent policies. It's a partial limit that will implement the same amount of demand reduction as a blackout of a certain size. Imagine a blackout of 5% of people without electricity. We will come up with a limit that will reduce demand by 5%. We find that we can do that without having anyone lose power, but maybe our kind of result in the paper that we did not expect is that we are bothering fewer people. So we are reducing power, but really not that many people notice. So you are keeping the lights on for everyone and only few households actually have to do something, which is sounds good. So that's what we present in the paper. So when are these limits useful? Mostly what I said, it's for systemic blackouts that you know in advance. You know that you will not have power and you know that demand and supply will not match and you need to lower the demand. When thinking about wildfires, we had some interactions with Pacific Gas and Electric, which is the utility there. And it seemed that technology would be slightly less useful because sometimes for a wildfire, you really have to leave one town out of power because it's the town that's maybe near a fire or yes, Katarina? Oh, what's happening before? So how would you determine what areas are blacked out or not? So Katarina is asking about how blackouts, yes, how blackouts work. This is kind of a, sec a secret recipe. Um, there are obvious rules that uh, are enforced. So if you have a hospital, uh, you are never blacked out. In Europe, I believe many parts of Brussels don't have blackouts. Uh, in Europe, it happens so little that even if you had data, you wouldn't be able to back it out, like to do some machine learning. What are they doing? There's just not enough events. In South Africa, it's happening every single day. So people are trying to see how is it really being implemented. In theory, it's kind of random and you do it the same to everyone. In practice, what's happening in South Africa is that um, the rich neighborhoods are adopting technologies to protect themselves via solar and batteries. And then the other neighborhoods uh, are seeing more blackouts in practice. Uh, but yes, a TBD. But yeah, it's basically a secret recipe kind of, yes. Um, yeah. It is a very controversial topic. If it doesn't happen very much, you have no way to tell what the secret recipe is. And if it happens quite often, then you can start uh, studying from a data point of view what, what is happening. Yes. And who is deciding? The companies? Um, this is... Um, Yes, it is a centralized procedure. These are uh, usually either privately owned or publicly owned um, regulated companies. Yes. So here it would be at high voltage uh, red electrica, which we need to see, but then it would be the distribution companies that have the low voltage grid that would be shutting down things. So I don't know the exact protocols here, if I can be honest. Um, although I did try to encourage them to use this method, but I haven't gone too far because again, they are very unlikely here. So, yes. No, I will be looking at getting the same demand reduction. You will see why we bother fewer people. It was, uh, it, it, it's via, via selection. I'll get there. Yes. Um, so will they be useful? I think in Spain and France, we already have the technology, so it would be super easy, but so far there doesn't seem to be a perceived need. I'm working on how to use this feature for less extreme events. For example, for managing demand um, when there is very little wind and very little solar, and maybe that would be interesting, even if technically you're not quite at the limit of a blackout, maybe with some price mechanisms, but for now, for the real extreme events, there doesn't seem to be a need here. I think the places where it's most useful is South Africa. Now let's see how those pilots are going there. And the US, the US that would be very useful. But uh, in the US, this concept of limiting your power at home does not exist other than the limit in your house. Houses have a natural limit, okay? You cannot plug in your new quantum computer into a house in the US. But... Um, but other than the physical limit of the house, this concept of a contractual limit doesn't exist. So most smart meters in the US, they would be really useful to do this, but most smart meters, even though they are relatively expensive, they are good smart meters, they don't have this, this feature. 
Uh, so, and then there are some parts like New York City that doesn't have any feature because they did the smart meters very early and they are very dumb in some ways. Yeah. But uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, that part is very exposed to these extreme events. I will not bother you with this. It's very much into the wits. So let's get into the framework. So we think about households, uh, which are indexed by I, getting some utility from electricity and then having to pay for it. This framework, we are not using it too much at the moment because I will be, I, as I told you, we are gonna use the same rule for everyone. But down the road, we wanna think about this uh, framework because there's this land item that allows you to treat households that are poor versus households that are rich differently. At the moment, we're not working too much with it, but the idea is to use this framework down the road to think if you might wanna do different rules depending on the need for electricity, which is this epsilon, and the need, uh, the burden, the burden of electricity on your income. So this epsilon can also be medical devices. And already today, if you have a life-saving medical device, you are never blacked out. So this is an example of another rule that's uncontroversial and well-known. An interesting of the thing of this epsilon, for example, a medical device, you really need electricity, is that in the current form, what you do is blacking out neighborhoods. So if there is somebody in your neighborhood that doesn't have, that has a medical condition, you are never blacked out too. So people have used this to look at the impact of blackouts on people because you can find neighborhoods where there is somebody with a medical device, neighborhoods without the medical device, and then you can compare similar people that never have a blackout because they are uh, protected. So that's, that's one example that is today happening. As I was mentioning, we'll be thinking about situations where demand, D, is way higher than supply and we need to cut power. And what we will be considering is a rationing mechanism that can limit the consumption of a household. The way we'll be thinking about it theoretically is that households will have to consume either the limit that we give them or their actual consumption, but it will be the minimum of the two. So they cannot consume over this limit. And we'll be thinking about this limit being zero when you are being blacked out and potentially infinite if you're not being blacked out. In practice, again, everyone has a limit, but, but let's think about it as not being binding. So when we do random rationing under a blackout, we will be thinking of a fraction alpha that gets blacked out. And alpha people will get zero electricity and one minus alpha people will get their, lim their un unconstrained limit. And this is what we think about it as the baseline. Blackouts or baseline, this will be the welfare when we have a blackout of 5%, 10%. It means that 5 or 10% of people don't get uh, electricity. And now what we'll be thinking is about a potentially flexible rule, although as I told you, not today, a potentially flexible rule that will set a limit and we'll be considering uh, a blackout equivalent policies. So we'll be asking what's the optimal policy that will keep that blackout at 5% or will keep that blackout at 20% so that we maximize welfare for the people in this uh, area, but subject to the fact that their consumption, given that we are limiting it, has to be at most the consumption that we are allowing under the blackout. So this will be the blackout equivalent policy. This is the unconstrained one, so obviously it will be better than um, the general blackout. A blackout is a subset of this policy. You could set a policy that implements a blackout, but you can do much, much better. So we'll be thinking about this uh, special case, power limits, and the parameters get much simpler because I, now I'm not trying to choose something that's targeted, that is different for every single person. I'm just trying to choose a fraction beta that will get selected for partial rationing. So beta, a fraction beta of people will be selected by the mechanism. And then those that get selected get a limit, but they get a limit higher than zero. So you get some more than under a blackout. So under partial uh, rationing, beta people will get kappa and the rest will consume whatever they were doing before. Now, because we are giving people something a bit better than zero, obviously beta is larger than alpha. We have to select more people for a partial mechanism. And that's why in our mind, we thought we would bother more people because you need more people to make an effort in this setting. 
But to our surprise, what we find is that, yes, you select more people, but actually fewer people notice. In particular, only those that are consuming above the limit will notice that there has been a blackout. So maybe you are selected, but you don't know because your house just keeps operating as normal and nothing goes dark. And this depends on the distribution of consumption. So what we find uh, on, on our theoretical results is that if the distribution of uh, consumption is heavy tailed. There are some very high users. Um, those high users contribute a lot to reducing demand and they leave the rest kind of unbothered. We can think about whether that's a good or a bad thing, but basically you're relying on the very high users to cut their power off. If that very high use is having a sauna or having a swimming pool, I think we all agree this is a good thing. If that very high use is um, all your heating works with electricity and you really need it, well, maybe there's a discussion to be had if this is an extreme event under cold conditions. So our result will work best if that consumption is driven by high income. And it will be more nuanced if that consumption is driven by an actual more like essential need. So, yeah. But in practice, I'll show you in the data, we find that indeed we bother way fewer people under this mechanism, something that we had really not expected until we did the, the study. Sorry, can I add? Uh, so you were saying that you were not taking uh, into account this difference between the different, uh, no, the, the the different kind of uh, like houses where you are cutting. Uh, is it possible to put more than one condition when you are selecting to who you are going to reduce? Yes, technically. Not only for rage, but also for example, uh, necessity or let's say. Um, yeah, yeah. Technically, the smart mirrors allow for any message to any household. Like in practice, I don't think you want a completely flexible rule, but uh, you can make it potentially a function of many things. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is something we're exploring in a follow-up paper. But for this paper, we just did the simple one okay. where we didn't have to make any any difficult statements somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, I think in practice, it could depend on all of that. It definitely would depend on a medical device. Mm -hmm. The difference is that now you would only be giving power to the person with a medical device rather than the entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. So you could pin this. Yeah, yeah, hundred no? percent. Yes, you need it. You are just. Yeah, another thing the... that I haven't mentioned is that you can uh, keep community meters and public meters unbothered. Then it will require higher efforts from households, mm -hmm. but it's very good because you keep public lights mm -hmm. and you keep elevators in communities working. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is a high consumption use, but you don't want people stuck in an elevator when there is a blackout. So. Our result would weaken because then you need to bother more people to compensate for the fact that you are allowing all this essential consumption, but it can be much better in general terms. Mm -hmm. But we haven't done those calculations here. Yes. Um, one thing that I'm saying is that, oh, you bother fewer people and you get more. It's kind of magical. But I want to be clear that you could never achieve a 100% blackout if you are giving things to people. So what we define is the maximum possible that you can achieve of a blackout if you allow people to consume. And obviously, the more limit you give to people, the, few, the smaller the blackout that you can achieve. So I'll show you the sizes of blackouts that we can achieve depending on the limit. How do you define the population that that is protected? So you have to say, is it by the, the entire town? The entire, the entire town? <laughs> So here we are working on an entire utility. And we also did exercises where we could only do it for a single zip code, a single, um, but, but for the results today, it's an entire utility. I'll show you the map in a second. Yes, yes. What we find is that if you can spread it out to the entire country, it's much better than relying on particular, because then you can cross Yes, yes, yes. So the idea is that it's everyone in that footprint. Yes. Just to clarify a bit, so this has this is uh, not perhaps not been implemented on the field. Is it has okay? Oh, in South Africa, I didn't know, but they uh, but they their meters can only do it if they buy them new. So they are doing a pilot of about forty thousand households, and I'm trying to. 
to see how it's going. This I was proposing it in Spain, but again, they are not too excited because these things in Spain don't happen too often. But I do think it would be worth it to have these protocols in place because it's not it's not a lot of work, but it's true that in their mind and it's probably accurate, it's really at the bottom of priorities because it's considered not 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 uh, not binding. But if if it looks like blackouts could start occurring, that's the first button I would press. Uh, yes, because the technology is there here. Yes, yeah. The data I'll show you, by the way, is from Spain because that's the data I have. So the thought experiment would be, what would happen if we can convince uh, Red Electrica and the distributional uh, the distribution companies and the regulator to make this happen again, relatively small value added today, but I do think in the future, it could be quite valuable. Yes, so this is kind of for tomorrow kind of thinking. Yes. So we also think about what would happen if we select everyone so that we can make the limit as high as possible. Under many assumptions, this could be the best scenario, right? You select every single person and then everyone has to do a little bit of an effort but not too big. So that would be setting beta equal to one and maximizing kappa such that you get the same blackout. And one question we ask in the paper from a more theoretical point of view is, is this a Pareto improvement? By Pareto improvement, we mean that everyone is better off. For households that are below the limit, they don't even notice whereas under a blackout with some probability, they would have a blackout. So they are absolutely better off. They don't have a blackout. And the alternative would be that with some probability, even if a small, they would have no power at all for a few hours. So this seems better. And for households who are above the limit, obviously they get limited. So this is not better. But it really depends, the overall welfare assessment depends on their, uh, their preferences for risk. So if you consider a blackout very, very risky, you might prefer to be limited than having a blackout, even if the limit happens more often than the blackout. But if you are limited every single hour of every single day and a blackout is not that bad to you, maybe you prefer to run a lottery and with some small probability be the one that's selected for a blackout. So it depends on the risk preferences. I will not go too much over this. This is a more technical part of the paper, but we take utility functions that as economists we like and that reflect risk preferences from households. And we derive conditions under which this thing is better for everyone. And the way we derive the conditions, it's basically saying, is there a, um, a certain value of risk aversion that makes this a Pareto improvement for everyone? And the second result is, what's the consumption at which I still prefer this? So imagine I have a limit of two and I consume three. Do I still prefer it or not? And how does this depend on my preferences for risk? I will show you this with the data uh, in a second, uh, which might be more intuitive. So heterogeneity, I will show you some results on that. We don't allow the mechanism to depend on heterogeneity, but I will show you how the impacts depend on the heterogeneity in the data. And I will skip this so that we can get into the data, which is what we want to do here. So we have data uh, jointly with a project with Natalia Fabra, who's an energy economist in Madrid. We have data from millions of households and we get data from their hourly consumption over a year and a half. Uh, so we see their data every single hour during that time period. Nice, we see also their contracted power, their contracted limit. So how much they are willing to pay for that limit. And we also see their postal code, which is obviously very important uh, for their demographic information. From previous work that we will use in this paper, so we will be building in previous work, we use machine learning tools to infer from a smart meter. You can infer whether somebody has heating and you can infer whether somebody has an air conditioner. So we can create dummy variables that tell us this household has heating, this household has air conditioning. And from that paper also, we use machine learning tools to infer individual income. So one limitation of our data is that we observe the postal code and the postal code, as you know, in Spain, it's quite a wide area and quite a diverse area. So if we just impute the income of the zip code to the households in that entire zip code, that is obviously not very informative. 
because many people stay home. So uh, every town has a bit of everything. At least in my experience, I come from a 6,000 people town and there's a bit of everything in there. So if we use the average income from that zip code, we miss a lot of the action. So we did some work uh, with machine learning tools to try to not perfectly infer individual income. Obviously, we're not magicians, but trying to improve uh, the distribution of income to have a better guess on the income of households by combining the census data with the smart meter data. And the intuition for that other paper is that when you see how people behave hourly in their electricity consumption, it's really very varied across households, but it does tell you a little bit something about their income. With cars, it's a bit more obvious. If somebody is driving a Ferrari or a Maserati, probably we can infer they have a lot of income. With electricity, it's a bit more subtle, but but you can you can do these things. And that's how we combine it in this work. Sorry, can I ask another question? So you say our um, the electricity consumption hourly, but then if you are analyzing this for extreme events, you are taking into account that probably this consumption is going to be higher. For example, if there is a snow, a very cold event, then the 